by giving a brief resume of the second session that was held yesterday afternoon. As you remember, I had started out in the very beginning of the seminar to give you an outline of the Hindu mythology of the nature of the universe. And then I went on in the second session to give an outline of the equivalent Christian mythology, which to some extent includes the Hebrew. And we saw that it had certain very, very distinctive and important features. First of all, that whereas in the Hindu world view, the creation is the dismemberment, the voluntary dismemberment of the creator. In the Christian and the Hebrew worldview, what is dismembered is not the Creator. The Creator remains eternally separate from the creation. And I explained it by the analogy, which indeed is the biblical analogy, of manufacture, pottery specifically. Adam is formed out of the clay. And so, uh, whereas the Hindu will say, Tatvam Asi, that art thou, where that means the ultimate that, the witch than which there is no witcher. Uh, the uh, a Christian is told every Ash Wednesday, remember, O man, that dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Except that by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, there may be salvation. Maybe. So the, uh, the tremendously important feature upon which the whole of the Christian worldview is based is uh, you could call it really three points and they are all to do with distinctions the eternal distinction of the creator from the creature of God from man the eternal distinction of good and evil these do not resolve themselves into an opposite the devil is malice but his malice is overruled it is not a case of Persian dualism as between Ormuzd, the principle of light, and Ariman, the principle of darkness. The malice of the devil is always under the control of the divine. It is allowed because freedom is allowed. But if freedom gets out of hand, in the end it is overruled, and the devil is consigned everlastingly to the torments of hell, with all his angels and the human beings he has managed to pervert. Except that by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, there may be salvation. Maybe. So the, the tremendously important feature upon which the whole of the Christian worldview is based is, uh, you could call it really three points, and they are all to do with distinctions. The eternal distinction of the Creator from the creature so that distinction between good and evil is a, a, a very important, firm feature of Christianity. It's a completely serious distinction. That is to say, the God is not acting his part, and the devil is not acting his part. They really mean it. And the third principle is an equally eternal distinction between persons. Just as you and I are not God, so, by the same measure, you and I are not each other. We are all distinct and we are all important in the eyes of God on the principle that just as a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without the, the Father in heaven being aware of it, uh, that means that every sparrow is important. So, to a much greater measure, every human being is important, immeasurably important, in the eyes of the Godhead. And so, uh, this, this constitutes, as it were, the basic distinction, the basic feature of all the theistic religions of Judaism in the first place, of Christianity in the second, and Islam in the third. Then I went on to explain, and in, in a sort of outline, the fact that Christianity consists, above all things, of a story. The story of the fall of the angels, followed by the fall of man, a perversion of the substance of the universe, that is to say, uh, a perversion of the very clay from which all things are made.
so that it has, as it were, a flaw or fault in it. I tried to show what the fall really consists in so far as man is concerned, which is pride. Uh, the original sin is not, as some people suppose, sexual intercourse. It is pride. It is taking the control of the world into one's own hands instead of being spontaneous, instead of simply trusting and acting like we suppose the animals to act and we suppose children to act on impulse. Once you start controlling, you are in the position of the sorcerer's apprentice. You've got to go on. And so we now witness mankind frantically endeavoring to control the amazing things that result from his technology and from his cleverness. The atomic bombs, the population explosion, the erosion of the soil, the proliferation of smog, the uh, uh, falling of the water table, the messing up of all bacteriological back, uh, entities by penicillin, and heaven only knows what. And we are fighting to control that, you see. And we are learning the lesson at last. So uh, that was the fall. And then I went on to try and describe the most difficult part of Christianity, which is what it means to say that the world is saved by Jesus Christ. And you hear some preacher hold forth about Jesus saves. Are you saved, brother? And we are saved by the blood of the Lamb, by the crucifixion of Christ on the cross. All this is sheer gobbledygook to most people. They haven't the faintest idea what it means. And nor are the preachers. But they think, you know, like a, a man like Billy Graham, he goes around with this and moves huge audiences. But he never explains what it is. He just says, believe it, and then you'll find it changes your behavior. But you see, if you're blessed or cursed with a critical intellect, you just can't swallow that. It just won't do. So then, uh, I tried to explain the doctrine of the incarnation. That is, the idea that in the historical appearance of Jesus Christ in the world, God became man. That is to say, the divine united itself with the human and with all the aspects of human life, with its birth, with its problems, with its suffering, and finally with its death. And so this union achieved a new start for the human race. And uh, therefore, through the through the gift, as it were, of love or grace or union with God to the human race, everybody is able, enabled to appropriate that gift. But you see, the gift is given to your substance and not to your person. That's the distinction I underlined. In, in, in Christian terminology, the person means the ego, the will. And the substance is, as it were, the stuff out of which you are made as pots are made of clay. All right, so the substance has now been rendered flawless. But it's up to you to appropriate that flawlessness by a voluntary act. And here's the nub. The nub is how, uh, under the former problem for the Jew, under the dispensation of the law and the prophets, was how am I to acquire a pure heart? How am I to obey the law in pureness of heart? To have, as in, to use Jeremiah's phrase, the law written in my inward parts. How am I to do that? And everybody who knows himself through and through finds out that he can't do that. He can't be spontaneous on purpose. And so, in Christianity, the same problem arises again in a far more crucial form. It says, you can obey the law. You can be a saint if you've got the power and the grace of God. Now, how do you get that? Well, uh, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to believe that all this is true, that uh, God really did become man in Jesus Christ. And uh, you've got to believe that. So you ask yourself, do I really believe it? And you think, you know, there's something uncertain about this, like St. Augustine's prayer, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You see? And so there's always this little worm at the center of things, where you know 
and become conscious of a certain element of irreducible rascality in you that lies at the very core of the will. And the question is, how do you will to abandon your will? You see, that's the problem. You must try not to try. You must freely give up your freedom. So in the words of the prayer, God in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. In the original Latin, whom to know is to live, whom to serve is to reign. R-E-I-G-N. So there is the puzzle of Christianity. Furthermore, we must remember that it's a, it, it's a terribly serious religion. There never was. Now, whereas the Hinduism uh, views the whole world as the play, the sport, the leela of the divine. In the West, the world is serious. It is a, a tragic view. If it's a dramatic view at all, it's a tragic drama. Whereas the, uh, the um, Eastern view is it's a comedy. Although it's curious, isn't it, that Dante could write the Divine Comedy? Because somewhere, you see, you can't, you can't get round it. That if the, the, the notation of life, if the meaning of life is fundamentally tragic, God's a washout. Uh, so there is the idea, really, in the kind of esoteric strain of the Christian tradition, uh, Dante brings it out, you see, when he heard the song of the angels, he said this sounded like the laughter of the universe. And all those angels in heaven get around the throne of God, and they sing hallelujah, 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 forever. And everybody, every child who goes to church thinks, oh, what a drag. You mean we've got to go up there and, like a church service forever, sing hallelujah around the throne? But you see, the, the, the preachers don't get it across, because they don't sing. They, they, uh, they don't realize that this word hallelujah uh, is a kind of um, a dance word. It's like, uh, almost, it's like scat singing, where all the meaning goes out of the language. And it's just rhythm. It's just sheer exuberance. And uh, Dante makes this quite plain, that these angels surrounding God have found it. They found the point. And there's no need for anything else, and the point has no point beyond being the point. It doesn't serve any end beyond itself. It's it. You're there. You've arrived, and they just go out of their minds. And so that is really what uh, even the most orthodox Christianity is after, if you will press the preacher and get him to follow the logic of his own belief. Now, when we put... Christianity, as I showed you, inside the context of Hinduism. And this is something that is happening by simply, by virtue of the spread of communications. <coughs> Before we had steamships, let alone jet aircraft, we thought that the world around the Medita Mediterranean was the only civilized world. Indeed, there were some extremely remote people called the Chinese who were supposed to be highly civilized, but they might, have well been, might as well have been on some other planet. But as our communication system has spread beyond the Mediterranean, it is perfectly inevitable that our culture and our religions have to exist in the context of others. And the very fact that this happens automatically changes their meaning, whether you like it or not. Just as the context of words changes the meaning of the individual words. So we then see that Christianity is now operating. It is in fact happening. This is not something I'm discussing as a, a, a quaint theory that is something that ought to happen. It's something that is happening. Christianity and Christians, with their particular beliefs and their particular points of view, are waking up to find themselves surrounded by very different peoples, also civilized, who have rather different points of view. Well, what's going to happen? What difference does it make? So, uh, then, I'm giving 
I'm putting Christianity in the context of Hinduism to make a special case, to give a specific example of the sort of thing that would happen. I'm not saying that it is going to happen just like this. I'm trying to indicate general directions. So then, the Hindu looks at Christianity and he says, good heavens. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? For here, in the many, many forms of being, which the Supreme Self, the Brahman, plays at being, here comes the Christian. The Christian soul. This is a new identity which the dancer of the universe is playing. And he's playing as far out as as he can get. He is dancing, not dancing. He is playing that he's not God at all and never was. And that he absolutely not that. Don't you dare claim any kinship with the Father. He created you out of nothing. You are not the God. You are made. The sun, the Logos, is begotten, you see. The creature is made and can be a son of God by adoption. The whole human race is orphaned. And God is the father by adopting, you see. So, uh, the Hindu would say, look at that. And what's more, this orphan, is it now adopted? Goodness, what are what conditions? Once you become adopted, you become responsible for making that choice between the good and evil. And if you choose the evil, you are lost forever. Absolutely lost, and you won't just be annihilated. You'll spend all the endless cycles of time in excruciating and ineffable agony. You will exist bodily as well as spiritually. You'll be devoured by ever-renewed worms and consumed by fires that will penetrate to the inmost centers of your nerves. You should hear the theologians describe it. <clears throat> if you look at my book, um, The Two Hands of God, I've got quotes in there from a great, very sophisticated German theologian, Matthias Schaeber one of the great horror writers of all time because he describes hell in the most sophisticated philosophical language. That's the, or something that the ordinary preacher doesn't do, like uh, Jonathan Edwards describing a sinner in the hands of an angry God. He used the ordinary vivid imagery. But Shaban goes into philosophical categories. I mean, he makes this so horrendous because he is obviously such a great intellectual describing the reality of physical torments as well as spiritual torments in hell. So, you see the predicament that the Christian soul is faced with. So the Hindu looks at that, you see, and says, that is something. Here, the action, the big act, is so good that the actor himself is totally taken in by his part. It's as if Hamlet actually slew Polonius on the stage. The actor of Hamlet actually slew the actor of Polonius. Uh, the drama is out of hand. But the Hindu knows it will recover because it's all right. Uh, don't worry, you know. But <laughs> it's okay that the doctor is the <laughs> And, uh, uh, but, but, but from his point of view, you see, he sees this as a, a very remarkable But now once the, we, we've looked at it that way, we've let the cat out of the bag, haven't we? Once you look at it that way, you can never go back to being an ordinary creature.